those of you that don't know me. Um, the topic I have today is uh, bronchiectasis, uh, the approach in management. So for today, we're going to basically cover um, diagnosis all the way through differentials, workups, and then management at the end. So for an outline for today, uh, the first thing I'll talk about the definition. Uh, we'll go through a little bit of the epidemiology, um, classification, uh, talk about the pathogenesis and proposed mechanisms, uh, differential diagnosis, um, specifically different diagnoses that are known to be associated with this, and then treatment options. So the definition um, of bronchiectasis, it's truly a dilation or ectasia of the airways and bronchus. Uh, the diagnosis is made by imaging, and it manifests as recurrent uh, chronic or refractory infections. A long-term sequelae include chronic airflow obstruction, uh, progressive impairment of breathing, and hemoptysis. So to talk a little bit about the epidemiology, historically it was thought to be associated with recurrent infections. And the incidence appears to be declining, which was thought to be due to the introduction of antibiotics and vaccines. Uh, currently, the numbers for incidents in the U.S. are 4 in 100,000 young adults and 272 in 100,000 of those over the age 75. Uh, the prevalence, though, has been found to be increasing. So in a study that uh, was taken over the years 2000 to 2007, uh, the, the prevalence increased by 8.7% per year. So the prevalence uh, peaked at around age 80 to 84, and there was found to be an increasing number associated with environmental causes and non-tuberculous mycobacterium. So classifications of this, uh, so diagnosis is on, the gold standard is a high resolution CT scan. Um, and the diagnosis is made when the internal diameter of the bronchus is larger than the accompanying vessel, or also when the bronchus fails to taper at the periphery. So this can be localized in one segment or lobe. Um, it can also be diffuse. Uh, the type in the diagram on the side just shows uh, classically how they're described. Uh, so there's normal, uh, there's cylindrical, varicose, and cystic. And then it's, it's been described as wet versus dry. So patients that have chronic cough often found to be productive. On imaging, it was found to be more in the dependent lobes. Whereas dry is patients that have this chronic, again, non-productive or rarely productive cough, which seems to be associated with upper lobes. Um, so the next, whoa, what did I hit? Okay, so there's three mechanisms for disease. Uh, there's traction, which is caused by fibrosis and ultimately st uh, stenting open the airways in the area of scarring. And this is associated with uh, diseases like sarcoid, ILD, or scarring from previous infections. And then there's tensile or weakness of the actual airways themselves. Uh, and this is, again, post-infectious. Uh, there's some structural abnormalities that we'll talk about. Um, when you're Kuhn syndrome, Williams-Campbell syndrome, as well as Marfan. And then pulsion which is permanent airway dilation secondary to inflammation that originates actually within the lumen. And a classic example of this is ABPA. So these are just CTs uh, to show classic findings. The first is cylindrical, and this is described as thin area, thin walled and large bronchus with the classic signet ring. Uh, the next is varicoid, which basically alludes to a varicose vein, and then it's dilations, outpouchings that are irregular. Uh, Saccular is also known as cystic, and what this is, is it includes focal or cystic dilatation in the distal airways, and this may result, uh, it may be isolated, but it may also be more confluent that results in the like, bronchiectatic consolidation. And then finally there's traction, so this is an uh, area of scarring or fibrosis that results in permanent stenting open of the airways. So the central question is, is infection the cause of bronchiectasis, or are there patients with bronchiectasis that are higher risk of developing infections? And if so, is there a predisposing condition? And if we know the predisposing condition, can we then uh, intervene or manage these patients differently? 
So host defenses, so the respiratory system, uh, people have mechanisms to combat or defend against microbes. And these include cough reflex, um, mucociliary escalator, antimicrobial peptides, especially IgA, and recruitment of T lymphocytes. So we have some disorders that actually can inter interrupt or, or cause some of these to um, act inappropriately or defective. So in CF, we have an abnormal mucociliary escalator. Uh, so we're looking for things that could go wrong here. So the pathogenesis, there's no uh, animal model for this, but the proposed mechanism is that it's uh, the, green, uh, the green salt at the bottom of the image are neutrophils. Uh, they are attracted due to inflammation um, from host uh, macrophages in the airways. So the, the, over, the circle is a cystic uh, bronchus, and it's lined with uh, ciliary cells and epithelial cells. So when the neutrophils enter, uh, very quickly they undergo apoptotic and necrotic uh, damage, and when they're broken down, they release proteases, especially elastase, and the result of this is, uh, is actually several. So they interrupt the epithelial layer. They cause, the elastase causes increase in uh, uh, sputum or mucus, and it, the elastase also has been shown to inhibit obstinization of bacteria. So the host can't recognize bacteria as foreign. So when all these, when the host defenses aren't able to contain this infection, you get this immune response. And their overall, res overall result is this vicious cycle. It's been well described um, that regardless of the underlying cause, the end pathway seems to be about the same. So you have uh, neutrophil inflammation, consistent with the slide before, that results in airway destruction, increased or abnormal mucus clearance, bacterial colonization, and then perpetuates the cycle again. So here we have um, a chest x-ray of a patient that shows, it's a little bit hard to see on there, but there's tram tracking on the left, or in the right lower base. And then on the CT, you see cylindrical bronchiectasis. So this is a patient that when you see this, you should think of the differential that could be causing this end result. So the differential, this is really broad, uh, but the differential includes uh, post-infectious causes, uh, primary immune disorders, as well as secondary immune problems, uh, inherited or structural abnormalities, um, and idiopathic inflammatory disorders, and inhalation and airway obstruction. And we'll talk about some of these. So the question is, is when somebody has these findings, what workup should be done? So these are from the British Thoracic Society, and it's agreed upon that a CT is, is necessary. That's what confirms the diagnosis. Um, PFTs are done to look for evidence of obstruction. And then CBC should be acquired looking for eosinophilia, leukocytosis, um, and sputum cultures, both routine as well as mycobacterial and uh, fungal cultures. Uh, testing specifically to exclude ABPA autoimmune labs, um, ANA, rheumatoid factor, and also de um, depending on symptoms. Um, all patients, regardless of age, should have an immunoglobulin level checked, um, including IgG, IgA, IgM. It should be done electrophoresis. Um, all patients uh, should have a sweat chloride testing, um, and then in some cases, even genotyping. And then alpha-1 antitrypsin levels. And in some patients, the, the entire test will also depend on additional symptoms that they have. So some sim patients have symptoms of GERD or aspiration, and that should also be evaluated. Uh, bronchoscopy is not a routine test done in the diagnosis. If it's localized or recurrent and progressing in one area, it's more reasonable or considered to be done, but not every patient. So we'll talk about some of the uh, classifications of diseases that lead to this process. The first one is lung injury due to acute infection. And so older generations did not have vaccines readily available or antibiotics. And it's uh, thought that they're recurrently exposed to traditional pathogens, strep pneumo, H flu, adenovirus, measles. And recurrent exposure to some of these infections led to the same pathway I, I already alluded to and caused bronchiectasis. Uh, so we also know that mixed infections, most commonly from oral flora, from aspiration, can cause the same process. 
So, uh, more recently, MAC has been implicated in bronchiectasis. Originally, it was thought to just be a colonizer. Um, but there's several uh, registries of bronchiectatic patients, and some of the studies have shown that 80 to 95 percent of patients uh, with MAC and bronchiectasis without a clear cause are females. Um, and this is Lady Windermere syndrome, so really the tall, thin, elegant woman with this chronic cough that they currently try to suppress uh, was, is due to MAC. And there's a predisposition for the right middle lobe, the lingula. Um, so the thoughts are, is estrogen a cause? So most of these patients happen to be postmenopausal, supporting the idea that low estrogen may be a risk factor or having higher levels would be protective. Um, so there's mice models that actually show that mice with higher estrogen protects them from MAC. Uh, next we'll talk about primary immune disorders. And the first, there's two classifications, B cell disorders and T cell deficiencies. And really a lot of this workup is often done in infancy if, it's, uh, if they have recurrent infections. Um, however, sometimes it is diagnosed later in life. So the most common is CVID, and that's known that it has low levels of IgG and IgA. Um, males and females are equal propensity. Uh, the next is X-linked gamma globulinemia or Bruton's, and that's uh, autosomal or X-linked recessive, so males only, and it's normal B cells that aren't functional. And then IgG subclass deficiencies, specifically IgG2 and IgG4. And it's important to consider these diseases because you can support them, you can give them immunoglobulin and help hopefully uh, improve their immune function. Um, it also is important to know because if you're prophylaxing them with vaccines, whether or not they're actually mounting that response. Uh, so additionally, there's T cell deficiencies. Uh, these are syndromes and DeGeorge classically is uh, associated with thymic hypoplasia. Hyper IgM and IgE job syndrome. Um, is associated with, um, I'm sorry, it's associated with uh, increased susceptibility to pyogenic infections. And, and the problem here is that there's T cells that are present, but they're unable to release the cytokines necessary. And then Wiscott Eldritch syndrome is associated with eczema, um, bronchiectasis, hypoplasia, the cartilage. Um, and all of these, there's an opportunity to intervene to hopefully slow the pr progress. So then we have inherited and structural abnormalities. Uh, so cystic fibrosis, I'll just talk about a little bit since we had a lecture just a uh, short time ago. Um, alpha-1 antitrypsin, and then cilia and cartilage disorders. So cystic fibrosis, it's the most common cause of bronchiectasis in the United States. Uh, one in 2,000 births in Caucasians. Uh, it's the most common uh, recessive early inherited trait. So this uh, NJH bronchiectasis registry is out of Denver, Colorado, and in one of their studies, it, they showed that 117 out of 865 of patients with bronchiectasis actually had abnormal CFTR genes despite having normal sweat chloride testing. Uh, so in the normal population, the rate of heterozygosity is supposed to be is thought to be six percent. So it leads to the thought that there is something about having an abnormal gene that leads to this condition. Um, these patients were also found to have airflow obstruction, sinusitis, and infertility, um, as well as uh, co-infection with pseudomonas. So there's actually two studies um, that show that in patients with bronchiectasis and or NTM, the CFTR mutation is present in 36 to 48 percent. Um, and through this process, we found that there's actually uh, two groups of patients with CF. The more classic abnormality is diagnosed at a young age, diagnosed at birth, abnormal sweat chloride testing, or abnormal genotyping. And then the less severe type, that's often normal sweat chloride testing and diagnosed later in life. Um, and then possibly a subset of that, or a variation of CF, is Young syndrome. And it's diagnosed uh, with bronchiectasis, obstructive azoospermia, so it's by default only a male condition. Um, and it's thought to be a variant of CF. And it's important to make these kind of, um, to find these abnormalities because the patients are treated slightly different. 
So alpha-1 antitrypsin, it's a little similar to CF. So in the same registry, 17% of patients with NTM in bronchiectasis were heterozygotes for alpha-1 antitrypsin. 27% uh, of those had rapidly growing NTM. Um, most did not have significant other findings. They did not have COPD or other findings of alpha-1 antitrypsin disease. Um, so those in this category that were on prolastin had fewer exacerbations, which suggested maybe there's a protective effect to having a normal enzyme. Uh, the next one I'll touch on is primary ciliary dyskinesia. And it's a heterogeneous uh, group of ultrastructural def deficits. So really the, the um, cartoon next to it is a cilia. And defects in any area of this can cause these disorders. So there's more that there's multiple. Um, it's actually a, a little bit difficult to diagnose. There's not one gene that's implicated. Um, it's just, it should be suspected in any patient with daily wet cough, uh, neonatal distress, uh, recurrent sinopulmonary infections, um, Cartagenaire syndrome. And the diagnosis, and it's usually done in infancy and childhood, is a nitric oxide testing. Um, an abnormally low level of nasal nitric oxide is suggestive of the disorder. It can also be seen in CF. Um, and once that's, if that is abnormally low, genetic testing should be done. Uh, so we'll move on to structural abnormalities. Um, munier kuhn syndrome is a congenital proximal tracheobronchomegaly um, with normal distal bronchi. So there's no elastic fibers um, or smooth muscle in the cartilage and the connective tissue which causes diverticula. So in this photo, or in these uh, images here, you see a massively dilated trachea, both on the x-ray and on the CT scan. And then below it, you see dilated main stem bronchi with relatively normal distant airways. The next is uh, Williams-Campbell syndrome or bronchomalacia. And this is absence of cartilage in lobar and segmental regions, and it leads to collapse. Um, the trachea is usually spared. So the picture here, you see a normal uh, main, or I'm sorry, normal main stem, and then these collections of cystic airways in the periphery. And knowing that these these that patients have this diagnosis may be helpful. Um, you can stent if there's proximal disease. Um, you can apply positive expiratory pressure. Um, unfortunately, in this group of patients, uh, transplants often difficult. There's size disparities at the area of anastomosis. So I'm not going to talk about all of these, um, but these connective tissue diseases are important to consider in patients um, that are diagnosed with this because bronchiectasis may actually antedate the autoimmune um, disease by several years. So the pulmonary findings may be the only findings that we have. Uh, so RA, Sjogren's, lupus, uh, ankylosing spondylitis, IBD, and relapsing polychondritis, and sarcoidosis. Oops. So sarcoidosis, for example, I won't go through the diagnosis of all of these, but it's commonly associated with this due to a number of mechanisms, and it causes traction and distortion, especially if there's fibrosis. It can cause airway stricturing and it can cause airway compression. All of these which can lead to that uh, localized inflammatory reaction and then ultimate airway destruction. So ankylosing spondylitis uh, is associated with upper lobe findings. Um, it's usually more localized. It also has a higher incidence of MAC. Uh, systemic lupus. So it's actually uh, been shown to be, bronchiectasis has been shown to be seen in about 20 patients with lupus at some point of their diagnosis. So it's considered to be possibly a comorbid event. And then there's inflammatory bowel diseases, uh, more associated with ulcerative colitis. Uh, inhalation and airway obstruction. So anytime patients have um, signs of aspiration, um, toxic injuries, chemical pneumonitis, um, tumors, any of these things can also lead to this condition. So aspiration. So it causes chemical damage and infection, uh, which then uh, propagates that inflammatory pathway. Um, and we associate this with depressed sensorium. So patients that have had trauma, alcohol, seizures, and then anything that affects brainstem function. So strokes, ALS, 
polio. Um, primary esophageal disorders have also been shown to be associated with bronchiectasis, including dysmotility issues, uh, tumors, uh, strictures, uh, decreased sphincter tone, and then gastric dysmotility um, obstruction. So in the same registry, uh, three-fourths of patients uh, with bronchiectasis were found to also have disorders of esophageal morphology, whether it's dilation, thickening. They were also, uh, some were found to have uh, disorders of function and motility and hiatal hernia. So the question is whether this is cause or effect. Um, it was also shown that in patients, 85 to 90 percent, 95 percent of patients with asthma or ILD also have esophageal dysfunction. So it's thought to be the disparity between intrathoracic and abdominal descending forces during coughing, but much research needs to be done on that. Uh, so really anything that causes obstruction of the airway can, can lead to bronchiectasis. Um, so I have a list, tumors, uh, benign, slow-growing, um, carcinomas, adenomas, papillomas, adenopathy, anything that can cause a narrowing. It basically is a nidus for infection. Um, foreign bodies in adults and children. Um, and here, I actually took this from Dr. Morris. So this is a CT of a 70-year-old woman. He had right lower lobe pneumonia, treated many, many times over. Um, finally had bronchoscopy, and the obstructing mass was peanut particles, um, which apparently she had not had for several years. So that's the destruction that can happen from a foreign body and, and recurrent pneumonia in the area. So ABPA is classically implicated here as well. And what happens is, is you have the inflammatory reaction from exposure to aspergillus that results in mucus plugging and distension with inflammation. Um, you get bronchial destruction. Um, you see it in refractory steroid-dependent asthma. And diagnosis-wise, this is why those labs in the beginning I mentioned were important. Looking for eosinophilia, um, IgE levels total, and IgE to aspergillus. Um, treatment is prednisone um, and then a taper following. But this is one of the instances where actually knowing the underlying uh, predisposing condition can actually affect outcomes. So here on CT you see this is a 44-year-old person. Um, IgE was greater than 1,000. There are 15% eosinophils um, and what they're seeing is uh, there's mucus plug in the right upper lobe. And then there's bronchiectasis and the classic signet rings on the right. So other causes include HIV, and it's thought to be due to recurrent infections and increasing oxidative stress. And then yellow nail syndrome, which I've never seen, but it's associated with dystrophic uh, thick nails, um, chronic lymphedema of the face, extremities, there's exudative pleural effusions, um, recurrent sinus and lower respiratory infections um, has a propensity for females over males. And then radiation injury is uh, not just from the fibrosis, but it actually has been uh, or thought to injure the major bronchi itself. So I showed you this a little bit before, and this is that vicious cycle that we talked about. And the goals of management, regardless, uh, unless you have an underlying cause that's curative or treatable, uh, really, we have four areas that we try and intervene on. And you have airway inflammation, we have macrolide therapy with obstruction, uh, you have pulmonary rehab, and you can manage their comorbidities. With abnormal mucus clearance, you have chest PT, airway adjuncts, and bacterial colonization, we have antibiotics. So currently, there's no standard formula for treatment. Um, so we use airway clearance, these anti-inflammatories, antimicrobials, and surgery. So for most patients, though, it ends up being a bit of trial and error, both, both based on their unique cause and their symptoms, as well as what the individuals are able to do, their preferences, um, and their tolerances. So the first, uh, tech, the first avenue we have to help them is clearance techniques. And consensus guidelines says that all patients should receive some sort of airway instruction on physiotherapy, whether that be chest physiotherapy, whether it be um, flutter valves, there should be something. So I just looked at a couple studies. Um, there was a review article done in 2013, and it looked at specifically non-CF bronchiectasis, and it was, they found five trials with 51 participants, so it's very small. 
And the conclusion is that the techniques are safe, and it suggests that there's improvement in sputum expectoration and redu reduced hyperinflation and improved quality of life. Um, the devices used were flutter valve, acapella valve, high frequency chest compression vests, but the data is very limited overall. Um, then there's pulmonary rehab and chest physiotherapy and an, and an eight week controlled exercise training program that included airway clearance versus standard of care. And the results show that patients that participated in the exercise and airway clearance had increased in their walk distance, improved dyspnea, and re reduced number of exacerbations. They also found, though, that at the end of the study, these benefits uh, did not last. So it suggested that continued um, exercise would be important. So inhaled beta agonists and our anticholinergics. There's not enough data to suggest. So currently, if there's Obstruction, um, patients are off, sometimes given a trial, but there's not enough data to go one way or the other. Um, hypertonic saline, specifically in non-CF bronchiectasis, it was studied, and there was found to be no difference between using isotonic saline. Um, patients in both groups actually felt a benefit. Um, Dornase alpha is a, a staple in CF treatment, and actually in a study with specifically non-CF, uh, they actually had more frequent exacerbations, hospitalizations, and antibiotic courses, so it's not recommended. Um, and then other things for airway clearance are things that fall under GERD management, fixing aspiration, um, swallowing techniques, reducing gastric acid. So anti-inflammatory therapy um, is, is thought to be a major role here, and the rationale is that cascade that we talked about earlier and that it should be able to intervene in that, in that cascade. So systemic corticosteroids were studied, and overall they do not offer a decline in FEV1. Um, some studies show that they reduce um, exacerbations, but overall the side effects are thought to outweigh the, the benefits. Um, then there's inhaled corticosteroids, and the most recent study I was able to find was in CHEST in 2012. And what they looked at was budesonide, a medium dose, with uh, formoterol versus high dose. Um, and patients in the treatment arm, the treatment arm being the budesonide plus formoterol, had less dyspnea, increased cough-free days, and improved health-related quality of life. But lung function and exacerbation frequency and bacterial colonization were no different. And the other issue is that but they're not sure if it's the lava that actually contributed to the benefit or the combination. So currently, there's no role for inhaled corticosteroids uh, with or without a lava in, unless the patient has existing asthma. Um, NSAIDs, there's no studies available. So there's three uh, large trials uh, regarding chronic macrolide use. Uh, the EMBRACE trial looked at 141 participants that had a history of one exacerbation within the previous year, and they were given azithromycin twice weekly over six months um, versus placebo. And this study found decreased sputum volume and decreased exacerbations in the treatment arm. Um, the BAT trial was 83 patients with greater than three exacerbations, and what they did was gave azithromycin 250 milligrams a day for 12 months. Um, the median exacerbations in the treatment group was zero, and in placebo it was two. Um, however, in this study, they show that there was over three time increase in resistance to macrolide strep, macrolide sensitive strep, and there was also increased abdominal pain and diarrhea in this group. Uh, the BLESS trial was 117 patients with greater than two exacerbations in the past year, and they looked at erythromycin, 400 milligrams, or placebo twice daily. And they found in the treatment group that there were decreased exacerbations by about a third, decreased sputum, and decreased FEV1 decline. So the issues with macrolides, though, is that they're not benign. Um, they have been shown to cause an increase in macrolide-resistant strep. Uh, they also cause increased resistance to non-TB um, mycobacterium. And they also are known to cause ototoxicity, which may or may not be reversible. And then they also uh, prolong the QT interval, so they have been associated with dysrhythmias and cardiac deaths. Um, so the question is, is do long-term antibiotics actually influ influence long-term outcomes? 
And right now, there's a theory that it may. So the goal is to improve symptoms, uh, reduce the number of infective exacerbations, and improve health status. So they've shown um, in several studies that patients chronically colonized with Pseudomonas have increased hospital admissions, worse quality of life, and more rapidly decline in their FEV1. So the theory is that if we can reduce this microbial load and then, in, and then in effect, reduce the inflammation, it may actually allow the airways a chance to heal. So the treatment that I sort of talked about before was chronic therapy for patients um, at all times. So what happens in an acute exacerbation? Well, an acute exacerbation of bronchiectasis is a little bit hard to define um, because symptoms may not change that much. So what we look at is uh, three things. There's usually an increase in sputum volume, an increase in sputum purulence, and then increased cough, wheezing, hypoxia, breathlessness. If all three of those components are present, it's considered to be an acute exacerbation. And this is from um, BTS, uh, the British Thoracic Society. So the first thing that you should do in an exacerbation uh, if there is obtain a sputum culture and then treat empirically in the time being. And the recommended um, antibiotic is amoxicillin 500 three times a week or amacolide unless you have previous cultures to look at. If you have previous cultures available, your choice of antibiotic should reflect what grew in the previous cultures. Um, Cipro should be used if patients are colonized with Pseudomonas, if it's susceptible. Um, if it's not susceptible, um, sometimes double coverage is used, as well as IV antibiotics during an acute exacerbation. So the current overall guidelines are to um, focus on eradicating Pseudomonas and MRSA on first identification um, because studies have shown that patients with bronchiectasis and these um, bacteria are, have faster FEV1 decline and they seem to have a worse uh, quality of life overall. So patients with three exacerbations per year that require antibiotics or fewer exacerbations per year that have uh, significant morbidity should be considered for long-term antibiotics. Um, first instance, uh, high doses, you know, on first treatment, high doses should be avoided, oral if possible, um, and it should be tailored due to sp um, by speed of microbiology. And then long-term use of quinolones uh, needs further studies. There seems to be high rates of resistance with it, though. Uh, so then there's the question of surgery. Uh, sur there's traditional indications for resection, which include chronic and disabling recurrent infections, um, life-threatening hemoptysis, um, although now bronchial artery embolization is probably the first line. Um, there may be a role of surgery if there's localized disease, and it may be available for cure. So if patients have um, very clear uh, lobar uh, bronchiectasis, um, many times, been shown many times that resection does offer uh, complete uh, resolution of symptoms. Um, it's thought to be part of a multidisciplinary approach when medications and other therapies fail. The most common complications, um, anytime, I mean, the common ones, pneumothorax, but the most prolonged one was a prolonged air leak was the most common. Uh, there's a role for diffuse disease as a palliative approach if patients continually have recurrent hemoptysis or other issues. Um, I think transplant is also a consideration. Um, again, if they have a declining, rapidly declining respiratory symptoms, they have a very low FEV1, or they have recurrent hemoptysis. So additional treatments, these are just treatments that um, every patient with chronic respiratory uh, illness should have, uh, vaccination for strep, pneumonia, uh, vaccination for the flu, smoking cessation, and oxygen if it's appropriate. So just to kind of recap in summary, so we talked about the diagnosis, which is dilation of the airways. It results in recurrent infection, infections. It's a diagnosis strictly made by CT. Um, there's multiple known causes, and perhaps determining the known causes may actually uh, affect long-term management and outcomes. And the workup should be done to exclude these, these problems, especially problems that are intervenable. Um, treatment is multifactorial. Uh, airway clearance, anti-inflammatories, antimicrobials are all used. 
Does anybody have any questions? I'm sorry? When you mention Um, on initial, I actually have it sitting over there, but on initial, I'll grab it really quick because I have it. It's an algorithm. It's um, in simple, uncomplicated, with no resistance. It's 14 days of Cipro oral. <coughs> No. I think there was, I mean, I, I can imagine that we need to study, but I think there has been a trend, at least in the CF side of projecting that when you make the solution to work, you should treat until the culture at least two or three weeks and check your culture to be sure that the culture is negative. And, okay, there has not been no study done to show that there is any benefit, but there's a perception that if you eradicate that it's a culture, so I, I don't have studies for non-CF as well. According to what I had read, it was that on first instance, you treat for 14 days. You can see how they do. If they are recurrently, and it's considered recurrence is more than three times in a year, you should consider both the suppressive oral antibiotics and possibly a pseudomonas, an alternating pseudomonas um, suppression. Any other questions?